Welcome everyone to our latest installment in our dialogue uh, series around making sense of crypto and Web3. Uh, I'm Rufus Pollock and the project is at web3.lifeitself.us and today I have the distinct pleasure to welcome uh, as my uh, dialogist, my collaborator, my guest, Corey Doctorow, who is a science fiction author, activist and journalist, uh, the author of many books including the recent How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism, uh, which is about monopoly and conspiracy. And as for decades, I can actually say now, uh, been working tirelessly for digital freedoms. Uh, I would say even a visionary activist. I think he just said it's his 20th anniversary at EFF and who I've known for quite a long time now as well. So it's a real pleasure to have you here, Corey. Um, welcome. Um, and today we're going to talk well, we're going to have a kind of open ranging discussion about these topics. And I would like to start maybe by setting out like what, what you know, what, what, what interests you particularly in this area around crypto and Web3, Corey, and what, what are the topics you think it connects to that, that would, you'd like to explore today? Sure. So, you know, as someone who is uh, very concerned about monopolization and the ability of firms to structure both the markets that they participate in and the lives of people who rely on on digital services the decentralization talk about web3 is something i find very exciting and in fact you know i keynoted i think the first three d web conferences at the internet archive which is where i think a lot of this stuff got started and um when i hear web3 people talk about what they value I often hear echoes of the stuff that I've worked on for 20 years, the, the rights of individuals and of um, uh, groups of, uh, of people, of communities to what I say, what I call seize the means of computation to, to decide how the technology that they use will work. Uh, you know, I think of myself as a 21st century Luddite in the sense that the Luddites were not concerned with getting rid of looms, but rather redefining the social relationships around looms that they weren't really concerned with what the technology did but who it did it for and, and and who it did it to and that's the thing i'm very concerned with as well i think that um web3 people and i also have some very sharp disagreements some of them are, are technical some are ethical some are economic and uh that you know trying to figure out where our common ground is and where we disagree is is a really useful thing to do and so you know i go on the cryptocurrency podcast the bitcoin podcast from time to time and argue with them about this stuff and and for me like i guess there's there's maybe three technological models we can think about here so the first one is asbestos and asbestos has some really useful industrial characteristics and i frankly don't care I just don't think we should use asbestos no matter how much of a public good it is to not be on fire we should just leave the asbestos in the ground and where we find it in the built environment we should remove it and put it in the ground the second one i think would be ddt which i think is much more of a mixed bag than we think about you know i i i am, am something yeah. of a connoisseur of weird old ads and one of my favorite genres of weird old ads is like um wallpaper for children's nurseries impregnated with ddt and uh you know that feels quite horrifying i think to to modern ears but my understanding of this of ddt and i'm not a biologist is that's actually not a bad idea at all that you know it's not gonna it's not gonna infect birds when it's in your wallpaper it's just gonna keep ticks and and other insects from getting into your kid's room and and infecting them with horrible insect-borne diseases and so maybe we need some kind of, of, of regime for DDT that is neither prohibition nor throwing the floodgates open, but thinking about some middle ground where we use it cautiously with a precautionary principle, principle in mind. And then the third technology would be the internet, which was developed more or less by my sworn enemies. You know, I grew up in the anti-nuclear proliferation movement and uh, my, uh, you know, my, my early political life was entirely about dismantling uh military spending a project that i still believe in wholeheartedly and yet i think the internet is a is a good and i think that the fact that it comes from horrible origins does not make it horrible 
And I, I, I think that it is absolutely redeemable. And so, you know, one of the questions that I have is like, to what extent are the various things that trade under Web3 or DWeb or DeFi or cryptocurrency or whatever we want to call a blockchain, to what extent are they like DDT or asbestos or the internet? Yeah, no, I think that's, um, yeah, fantastic kind of analogy and concrete analogies or metaphors for, for, for ways of seeing uh, different types of technology and their implication. Uh, and it really, I want to add this kind of, this project of, of making sense of Web3 is that aspect of sense making or making sense and therefore making choices about technology is, is, um, isn't, e isn't always easy. It's, it's hard to foresee the implications. Is it asbestos? Is it, is it DDT or is it um, the internet? And more than that, this is an, this, these topics do uh, particularly kind of Web3 and crypto and blockchain, at least in theory, talk to several interlocking areas that people find hard to cover. There's the technology part, there's an economic, and then there's a kind of political and social um, theory or, 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 you know, like what is, you know, crypto often brings up not only blockchain, but what is money? What is the purpose of money? What is, what is the macroeconomics of money? Um, <clears throat> at the same um, time, I think that those things are, can sometimes be bewildering and leave people to go, it just must be very complicated. Let's leave the geeks to work it out, which I think is one of, is, is the, the, a great, a great mistake. So let's, let's dive in a little bit here and look. So you, you talked at the beginning, what, let's talk through some of the uh, reservations or some of the things, the concerns that, that you've talked about also online. And in doing that, we might talk about what also the, 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 the possibilities, but let's start out with the kind of, um, economic side of it. Um, what 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 are the concerns there on the kind of yeah on the kind of money or the economic side of it? So I I uh, will lay my cards on the table. I'm an MM tier, uh, and um, I I think that uh, the origins of money do not arise uh, out of barter. I think that uh, there's no good anthropological evidence that money was was created to ease barter. And that money is created by states, however they're constituted as authoritarian or as democratically accountable, uh, in order to um, provision the state. And that the reason, the, the, the way that money becomes valuable, contra to the normal narrative about credit and, and belief, is that uh, the state and other entities have the power to declare that certain tokens can only be used to, to settle certain liabilities and to impose penalties on people who can't meet those liabilities. In the context of the state, that's a tax liability that can only be settled in the state's own token. Yeah. And, and in the context of cryptocurrency, I, I think we dramatically under theorize the liquidity of, of cryptocurrency that's driven by the fact that you can only settle ransomware liabilities with it. Uh, and that there is a, there is a, an underlying pressure on cryptocurrency for people to, to do things to get cryptocurrency because they, they have a, a very powerful coercive liability underpinning it. And, you know, we, before we went on mic, we talked briefly about uh, liquidation preferences and thinking about disasters and, and um, planning for, for the worst. And I think that there are lots of things that act like money in good times, right? There are lots of tokens yes. that you can trade in good times, but there are only a few that act like money in bad times. And so, yeah, sure, people will trade Bitcoin for other stuff uh, or other, other cryptocurrencies for other stuff when, when everything is going well, but when everything goes badly, they, they tend to abandon those because they re reconsider their priorities and they say, well, I have some non-negotiable liabilities to settle that I can only settle using certain tokens and I must acquire those tokens. And they become really indifferent to a lot of other forms of value. And I think that there's a mistake that often occurs where people say these beanie babies, these crypto tokens, these rare Magic the Gathering cards, this old wine is very valuable and it will remain valuable because of some fundamental or other, and it will remain valuable even in times of crisis. And then the thing that they miss is that in times of crisis, it's actually 
those those tokens that can only be used to settle non-discretionary liabilities that are truly valuable. So yeah, does uh, uh, so this is a really I think foundational point for the kind of new money, the neo metalist type discussions. I think, and just, so just to if I'm recreating the key by MMT, just so for listen with modern monetary theory, I think there are, the, the point also would be. So I would also agree that that's a really key point. Whether whether it's true that's the origin, like to be honest, I think for the audience doesn't matter. The key point would be that when people say stuff like just fiat, as soon as you hear this in the kind of crypto, so it's like, hey, your dollars just like people made up. It's valuable. There's kind of yes, and the U.S. Army, you know, like you know, like and the, the the whole complex of the state that means that you need to pay taxes that you can you know and that that counts for a a significant portion of GDP, so a large amount of, of, you know, just your economy is related to, you know, to settling something which must be settled, as you say, in these currencies. So even if, like, even this kind of belief equilibrium arguments, which is that kind of currency is just given by, you know, we just value gold because we value gold. So why can't we value Bitcoin or anything else or some other token? And I think that's a really great point you're saying is that, that there's a lot of fragility to that, that that, and that we haven't seen it. The other point we haven't really seen. A lot of this stuff tested you know we're not talking here about like oh this isn't just new tech these are fundamental claims about changes in the nature of you know macroeconomic structures that have been around for hundreds or thousands of years um so that's i think a really a really you know a really good point so this, this kind of point one is this just a skepticism there's also a point which is one of the other things that's odd and i think important related to the state i think which I want to draw out is what you said is one, um, and this relates to an ideological position, there's often a good portion, not all of the, the crypto community, that is somewhat, I'd say, libertarian inclined, where versus the state, it's almost a, you know, the state is a good thing or you know, a bad thing. In this story, like, hey, actually, the state having the control of the money supply in MOT is not a bad thing. I mean, you know, it can be or it could be, but it's like often useful. And the other is this kind of point about deflation. So do you want to talk to that? Because built into kind of traditionally into crypto, at least Bitcoin was both a kind of libertarian aspect and, it, well, a gold standard, the deflationary aspect, like there's only a limited supply of Bitcoin. And that's a great thing. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So I think that metalism and deflationism and whatever else we want to call those, the inflation hawk stuff uh, is, is driven by, I think, a cargo cult mentality around the relationship to state spending, uh, the monetary supply and resources. So I think that um, it is very obvious and that even the people who are strict anti-central bank, you know, even the most wild conspiracist will say not monetarily constrained. In fact, that's they think that's the problem, right? But governments can clearly always make as many dollars. If you are the US mint, you have no barriers to making dollars. You don't even need ink and paper, right? You're just typing zeros into a spreadsheet at the central bank. And so the, the, it's very clear that we are not monetarily constrained if you're a sovereign currency issuer. However, clearly governments do have constraints. And the, the real constraint is the resource constraint, which is what is for sale in the currency that the government issues. And that is the function of, on the one hand, things like the territory that the government commands and the resources that are found on it. But those, as, as you know, we can see from extremely wealthy countries that have relatively small territory that are relatively resource constrained, like Finland, say, that those are secondary to the development, the orderly development of the capacity within the borders of the country, the sovereign country that issues the currency, that capacity, which can be cultivated through education, industrialization, infrastructure spending, and so on, that capacity is um, almost entirely dependent on not resources, but uh, per se, but rather the collective will of the people and its ability to solve the collective action problem that results in the construction of roads and factories, schools and uh, social services, and so on. And um, if you are a medalist, a neo-medalist, and you think that the money comes from the people and then the government takes it away, 
then you think that the economy runs on money that that the thing that um determines what gets made or built or 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 acquired or moved around is spending so if you have coin or crypto or gold or greenbacks you can get a refrigerator installed in your house and a generator or solar power or connect up to the mains and that is true but it is downstream of the fact that all of those things including the money exist because of someone who builds a framework with varying degrees of freedom and constraint that ensures that the metals the contracts the power the praxis the knowledge even the health of the person who comes out and delivers your petrol if you've got a, a gas generator and you're completely off the grid that all of that stuff is is upstream of it and that's what central banks are meant to be monkeying with right is is and and governments is they're supposed to be establishing rules of the road they're supposed to be mobilizing capital they're supposed to be demobilizing capital right but constraining public aggregate demand to create fiscal space so if you say what we really need as a country is um vaccines then maybe what what the state does is either through direct coercive um you know war powers act intervention or through taxation which deprives uh the capital classes of the ability to to allocate capital they they remove the choice of the private sector to use a factory that might be turned to vaccine production uh and they they arrogate to themselves that choice and they direct it because we all know anyone who's ever played a sim game that there are some things that are locally optimal for actors within the sim for people who are who can only see as far as the horizon around them but that if you can see them from a bird's eye view you can see that they're very non-optimal and that actually that this is going to produce a an uh, irreconcilable crisis if if there isn't some top-down intervention and you know as an anti-authoritarian i would like to minimize the amount of top-down intervention we need but i don't think it's zero and i think that one of yes. the ways that we, we we minimize it is by is by having democratic accountability in those institutions and this is where the economics crosses over with the politics which is that if you build systems grounded in financial secrecy and the dismantling of the state you do not create a stateless society you create a capturable kleptocratic society yes. that does whatever rich people tell it to do and you know this is a thing i've been thinking about a lot in the context of libertarian exit and you know all these people are trying to build countries and and islands mm -hmm. and seasteading and so on that that um they're apt to, uh, history history tells us that they will create strongman societies that they're not that the the thing the precondition for a country that is willing to let you build an, an a tax-free island is that it's run by people who don't give a shit about the public good and who will someday turn around bring the army over to your island and take all of your stuff and that and that that is just no way to run a free society yes i mean i think this is just such a foundational point in the discussion and why it's also such a rich point i think in the discussion is that from this one thread about maybe sometimes about money at least from a just from a kind of i don't say intellectual but from a yeah from a this the what is the state and its purpose and what i think the crucial point that i hear you're making here is that rather than being parasitic which i think is often the assumption it's actually this crucial i mean of course there are abusive states of course there are many aspects where even even if sometimes the state grew out of a kind of um what would you call it like a protection racket story of the state it still provides huge numbers of crucial public goods and other things and one of which actually is you mentioned i mean control of the currency isn't just a means of exchange it does many other things and so i'm um this this kind of question of how do public goods get created how do they get maintained and the role of the state in that and the messiness of that i mean i think just just i don't want to go take us off here but i think it was one of the things 
I mean, my first thing I ever wrote really about this in 2016 or a bit earlier was about, was the analogy with the early days of online games. Everyone was like, oh, we're going to be able to kind of, you know, even in the early, you will remember, but the late, the first internet people was like, okay, we're, you know, in second life, they're not in the second, you know, we're going to, we're going to create these online worlds. And of course we'll be able to experiment and it will become, you know, radically democratic and egalitarian. And, and of course <laughs> you just ran into the same problems people had run into for hundreds, you know, rather than there isn't a magic solution to these hard, you know, the, these problems. I mean, the famous story of the toading of Mr. Bungle, you know, what, you know, how does authority arise when people do unacceptable things and so on, or in this case, you know, how do we pay taxes? So I just want to kind of come, come back. So that's, like, I think, a very point. You, you also talked about a kind of, there's a kind of crowding effect or that, that is also an issue here in terms of the mentality, maybe, or the, the, the approach that that's kind of implicit in some of the Web3 web or crypto thinking. Do you want to talk a little bit about that as well? Sure. So, you know, the, the neo-metalist deflationary, whatever you want to call them, you know, agoric mindset um, is built in this idea that you produce a homeostatic, like Pareto optimal distributions by allowing people to freely transact with one another. You know, and this is this is Hayek and his idea of markets as information processing machines, and that the only way to really understand optimal allocations is to just run the computer, run the economy, and let the let the individual agents within the within this system um, freely transact with one another to arrive at things. And the one of the ways in which this is uh, one of the one of the historic stories that is told to make people believe this, that is still cited today, is the story of the tragedy of the commons. It's Garrett, Garrett Hardin's uh, paper about this. The 68, now, yeah. Hardin was an academic fraud, and he later admitted that he made it all up. Moreover, he was a white nationalist eugenicist who used the story of the tragedy of the commons to explain why it was right to take things away from the savages and give them to the landlords so that the landlords could manage them because the childlike savages in their in their lack of self-restraint and 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 ability to understand the big picture would just overgraze their sheep until there was nothing left now ironically there was a real economist who won well, a fake nobel prize because the nobel prize in economics is fake but who won an actual nobel prize for talking about how commons works, and that's Eleanor Ostrom, who actually looked at how commons works instead of having the Gedanken experiment that that Hardin used to describe how commons must have worked. And what she found is that we can run commons. It's it's hard work, right? Just like any other kind of resource allocation problem, it's hard work, but it doesn't look a goddamn thing like markets. It, it's not quid pro quo. And you'd be surprised at how often, you know, if I write about, I wrote about, uh, I wrote a thing called the rent's too damn high about, about the problem of treating housing primarily as an asset instead of a human right and all the ways that that screws things up. And someone came along and said, but you have to understand that even in the caveman days, if you didn't contribute, they'd throw you out of the cave. And, you know, this was a real kind of Wikipedia citation needed. Like, you know, the Flintstones weren't a documentary, right? Like, we know nothing about who got thrown out of the cave. Like literally that is just a thing you imagined vividly in your mind and decided must be true. There's um, a bit, there's a, a wonderful writer who's dead now, who's not related to me named E.L. Doctorow, who wrote yes. a, an essay called yes. the, Cre yeah, he wrote an essay called The Creationists about the act of creation. And he talks about the fact that um, the Genesis story, which originated with the Babylonians and then the Hebrews stole it, that one of the reasons the Babylonians thought the Genesis story must be true is they just um, couldn't imagine that they could come up with an idea that cool unless it was divinely inspired, right? They like any idea that made that much sense must be true because God must have put it in their heads. And I feel like that's the that is the epistemological basis for our beliefs about cavemen and pulling your own pulling your own weight and markets and agorics. Now the reality is that. Um, Human beings have a mix of motivations and we have a mix of ways of organizing ourselves. Some of those are indeed transactional. 
and some of them really aren't. I mean, you know, we before we got on mic, we were talking about our our uh, relationships, the fact that we're both married and have kids, and you know, one of the things that defines a successful long term relationship is that they are not fair. That there will be things that you do that you think are holding up your end, and that your partner will not do and hold up their end, no matter how many times you explain to them that you're going to do X, Y, and Z, and then it's their turn to do X, Y, and Z, and they will say, Z is just unimportant, and I'm never going to do Z. And that is the price of admission of being in a marriage with me. And we do not bank it. We don't have a list where we say, well, I've done three Ys, and that uh, makes up for the Z I didn't do. We just figure it out. We just let go of this idea that everything is a swap and a fair exchange. And what we end up with is something that looks a lot more like from each according to their proclivities and to each according to their needs. And um, a lot of our lives are run that way. And there are a lot of things that people want to put on the blockchain and thus make transactional, intrinsically transactional, that I think not only don't belong in the realm of quid pro quo style negotiation, but if they were put there would be a catastrophe. And, you know, the example that um, I, I you often hear from Molly White, who runs Web3 is going great, is Wikipedia, which lots of people want to put on the fucking blockchain. And they're all, none of them are Wikipedians. Because if they were, they would go, wait a second, you're going to pay people for edits? That is a terrible idea. And we're never going to do that. Holy shit. Have you, uh, like, are you crazy? Stop talking this way. Um, I, you know, that is like, as the physicists say, not even wrong. And, you know, you sometimes hear tell of people who send their kids an invoice when they turn 18 for all the money that they spent raising them. And you realize just how monstrous that way of, of thinking about certain kinds of relationships really are. Yeah. Again, I, I think this is a really key point you're making. <clears throat> um, and, and it's funny because I want to bring out that I think there's, there's a key good point that's that's behind it that's 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 brought up in the web3 and crypto stuff which is and which is funny because there is a lot of concern with for example tragedy of the you've made the point but let's say about the information commons that things are not funded an area that i'm also very interested in you know how does open source software how does wikipedia or other things like it get created and resourced but even more broadly you know i'm, I'm actually surprised you know i kind of partly got intrigued again about Web3 because I kind of knew, kind of, I'd call progressive friends of mine who were like, wow, you know, we're going to address the climate crisis or we're going <laughs> to solve, you know, even physical commons problems. Apologies if you hear my young son in the background. Um, you should pay uh, him to be quiet. We should pay him to be quiet. Uh, I mean, just just on that, you, you've made a very good, so the point we're getting at is that there's, there is a genuine point there that how do we address a commons problems um and the what's odd and i think you're pointing at is the way that i at least tends to go in web3 or crypto is like we're going to measure that and financialize it not only are we going to measure it we're going to turn that measure into money and and, it, and as you say i mean again this uh, you might be familiar with this there's many of them but the very famous study uh done now you know about how many people pay for child being late to pick up their kid in a, in Tel Aviv, a nursery, and the impact sure. was that 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 people were later. Um, that that the the effect of actually having financial sanctions was actually the opposite, and, and that worse, it was irreversible. When they, re I think, the more significant point for me is that when you removed that after the experiment ended, people didn't go back. You altered people's mentality and behavior, and this kind of hyper financialization. Um, and the other area that I think is really, really crucial to our society today has been around education, and healthcare, areas that traditionally, well, obviously you need to pay teachers. And in fact, teachers should be paid a, a good wage, uh, similarly doctors. But if you think that if you, I, I want to be in a society where teachers and doctors are paid well, but I don't want to be in a society where teachers and doctors do their job because they're paid, if you, if you see what I'm saying. That, and that is a, 
a huge error because so much of teaching and health we hope comes from someone's volition some, and something that we can't measure we can't really measure if you think of any great teacher that you've had and most of us we if we're lucky have had at least one in our life you never thought they were doing it for the money of course they needed money but what made them a great teacher was some kind of passion to transmit to engage to support to nurture um, and and it often the whole thing that was at least in my memory great about many of them was that they went well beyond whatever the syllabus or the they were they were they were explorers they wanted to kind of induct you as a teacher into the kind of the 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 the, the joy of learning so i just kind of i think that switch is what you're really getting at there and that is crucial which is when we it's one thing to think we need money wikipedia without any money wikipedia wouldn't maybe be able to run its service but that's not that's not why wikipedians contribute and as you say it would have the very opposite effect and, and, and quite disastrous ones that we've seen on large scale of teaching to the test i mean it's just you know in, in and so on and so forth in education so i think that's and, and I think that I want to emphasize and I want to pull out and ask you a bit more because I think this is also why I find the Crypto and Web3 discussion fascinating is that that relates to general um, tendencies politically that we are seeing. Like this, this move to more financialization, this move to like measuring things, which in some ways is important. We haven't been measuring carbon dioxide or something, but the confusion of that with like measuring with money, with with incentives is this very subtle and slippery slope. And it, but it's something that we've obviously now for the last 40 or 50 years been a political direction. You mentioned Hayek. Um, so is there anything more you'd like to say that about the kind of broader yeah. ideological movement that this connects to? Well, so I want to point out a fracture line that's a lot more familiar maybe to people who uh, are involved in these causes, but aren't, um, you know, crypto weirdos on, on one side or the other of that debate which is the privacy discussion. And uh, so you can see the privacy discussion moving through like multiple uh, different sort of ideological bases. So the first one was this consent framework where we said that uh, it was a kind of like it or leave it uh, privacy bargain. You came to the website, there was uh, at first, there was just a link that said, you have already agreed to my terms and conditions, excuse me. You have already agreed to my terms and conditions, you know, like, like by being dumb enough to cross my threshold, you agree that I'm allowed to come over to your house and, you know, punch your grandma and wear your underwear and make long distance calls and eat all the food in your fridge too late. You've already agreed. Right. And then when that fiction wore a little thin, we replaced it with the kind of equivalent of a shrink wrap license or a click wrap license, where it was like, if you want to stay on this website, you have to click. I agree. But you, but you know, once you click, I agree, then you've agreed. Um, and this was this idea that, well, the, the universe is full of offers. And if you don't like the offer being given here, you can go somewhere else. And of course, this was occurring at the same time. This isn't the only problem with that ideology, but th this was occurring at the same time as the final nails were being driven into the coffin of merger scrutiny. And so the number of offers was going monotonically down, racing to the bottom, where your offers were reduced to one or two or, or three, and they all somehow seemed to arrive at the same set of terms and conditions. And so there really wasn't any choice. Um, and a lot of people who became disillusioned because of that, who initially believed in consent, but found that consent wasn't, wasn't solving it for them, who, who thought that transacting freely freely agreed upon transactions will produce an optimal outcome and who found that it wasn't they have now turned to the idea of a data dividend and they say that the real problem is that our valuable data is being stolen from us and we're not being paid for it the attention so we, economy i should yeah. sell my attention yes. so we should sell our attention right and you know this is also a catastrophe and it's a catastrophe for the same reason that consent framework was a catastrophe, which is that um, although privacy is valuable, it is not uh, well captured in, with monetary measures. And it is in no way unique in this regard. There are many things, the most important things in our life, that if you measure them with money, you are thought of as a monster. So 
human lives, right? Um, uh, my daughter isn't my property. Um, she is not her own property. She is not her grandparents' property or my wife's property or the property of Child Protective Services or the Burbank Unified School District. But we all have interests in her and those interests overlap and they're defined by a sui generis body of law that makes kidnapping something different from theft of child. And to, to constrain our discussion of the value of a child to the monetary loss arising from a kidnapping is something that intuitively we all understand to be monstrous. And you cannot sell your child and it, it doesn't matter how much the, the child is worth to you, you cannot sell them. And privacy is a lot more like one of those sui generis valuable things that if we try to use monetary um, systems to allocate them, produce bad outcomes, then it is like automobiles or uh, ceramic tiles. And it is a human right and human rights are broadly speaking things that we shouldn't sell, that, that shouldn't be commodities. And so I think that you shouldn't be able to sell your privacy for the same reason you shouldn't be able to sell your kidneys. And I also think that the rules surrounding your privacy should be regulated in the same way that the rules surrounding your health might be regulated, where um, you can't uh, freely choose to go into a restaurant where they have opted not to wash their hands before handling the food. We just, we have some baselines. We say that there, that the coercive power uh, of uh, firms is such that there must be some constraints on their ability to bargain with others because they will out bargain them. And that certain things like the ability to eat without getting dysentery shouldn't be luxuries. Uh, they should be universals. And that requires that we do not allow firms to lower prices by eliminating hand washing. And even if that might give poor people more access to more food, and that instead we resolve the issues of poor people needing access to food in different ways that preserve the human right to not be poisoned by what you eat. And so I want to just link this, because this is really, so just in, in the discussion, why this is so relevant to Web3 and crypto, and especially Web3, is there are a lot of aspirations in that space to address these kind of like larger public good or collective action or, or just collective organization type problems. And what we're getting at here in what you were just saying, just so I distill it for myself and maybe listeners is to say, hey, um, the great danger is that they're talking about these, these, these areas but there's a tendency to reduce the way we're going to organize to be transactional and even monetary. I mean, whether it's in tokens, but it's like we're going to reduce complex organizational debates um, about, um, you know, and this could be like everything at the moment. So we're at climate change, how we fund open source, how we organize society in the biggest visions to like the possession of certain tokens that will try to trade with other tokens. And I have had discussion with people like, well, of course, there'll just be a token for everything. There'll be a token, you know, maybe in a, even a good vision. You know, if you want access to the beach, have you contributed to the DAO that funds beach cleanup? Or, you know, if you want to have access to this piece of software, have you con contributed to the right DAO? If you want to I don't know, go to this part of the highlands to visit the, the nature. Well, have you contributed to the nature preservation DAO? And the funny thing is they're from very well intentioned. There's this idea of like, ah, well, we should have a way of funding those things and we should. But the, 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 the reduction of that to that kind of transactional model. And also I think the other point that you've been getting at that I do want to bring out is the kind of often the implicit dislike of the state. The love of that transactional model is it's this Hayekian market model. We have no need for some central actor, exactly. And forgetting that what the state is doing often is not, um, it's not providing some other, alter it's doing something kind of richer um, than, than a transactional model, but just organized by this kind of, you know, um, the, the central planner, uh, as it's sometimes put in economics. Just as when the state organizes education, now there's many be many defects or healthcare, it's doing something quite rich. You know, that there's there's 
even in small scale societies, when you have the shaman, there's a really rich set of things, some of which may involve money or resources. The shaman in the basic, you know, like to take it out of modern society, may receive choice cuts of meat from the kill. But they're also embedded in a whole web of understanding and culture that's much richer. So I think there's something like really, and what I think finally is to say that story of the Tel Aviv nursery is very relevant here. If we, when we go down this route of reduction of many relationships or organizational activity to like, we're going to have different tokens and trade them around, it has an effect on the way of being and of thinking of people. And we have now quite good evidence that, that we, actually, we actually change in how we think about relationships um, and so on and so forth. So I think that's a really, really important point. And I want to then come now from, from that kind of crowding effect and the effect of a transactional mindset and the hyper-financialization, if you put it, to the technical matter uh, that there are issues, which is, you know, I'm, it's kind of, I must say, I'm fortunate it's cool to have someone of such a rich, <laughs> you know, truly rich diversity of, of kind of knowledge and experience. So what you want to talk about some of the technical thoughts or, or, or views or concerns you have around crypto and Web3? Sure. You know, I, I, so I, I have spent 20 years fighting in part about the other crypto, cryptography and information security. Uh, and, and, you know, people may not appreciate this in, in the year of our Lord 20 and 22, but there was a time in living memory when governments treated cryptography as ammunition and uh, they prohibited civilians from accessing it. And the right to have maths was eventually won not by um, outmaneuvering the state with technology that they couldn't suppress, but rather by bringing a lawsuit that appealed to the American constitutional value of free expression. And this was in 1992. This was the Bernstein case that argued that programmers had the First Amendment free expression right to publish source code. And that source code was a form of expressive speech. And that if that source code embodied something that the NSA con considered uh, munition, then that was tough news for the NSA because the Constitution uh, guaranteed the programmers that right. And that basically ended the crypto wars as we understand them, although they, they pop up, they flare up from time to time. And, you know, interestingly enough, the advocates for cryptography or the cypherpunks who are the spiritual and in some case literal ancestors of the, the cryptocurrency movement, they um, tried lots of stuff to legalize strong crypto, uh, working crypto that didn't work. Um, so sitting next to me in my office is a, a, a bar refrigerator sized computer called Deep Crack that was built for a quarter of a million dollars by John Gilmore and some of his friends during the crypto wars. Uh, and it was built to brute force uh, the entirety of the key space of DES50, which was the cipher that the NSA said was strong enough for civilian access. John got tired of having it in his garage. And he said, you can have it uh, as sort of a permanent loan. You can't give it away. You can't throw it away, but you can keep it for as long as you will keep it. And then you have to give it back to me. So here it is in my office. I've taken one of its circuit boards out and framed it and hung it on the wall here. And um, Deep Crack, you know, should have been a devastating demonstration. You know, they went to uh, the court and they said, the, you know, here was the NSA on the one side saying des 50 is all you need that if you're an american bank or an american corporation or just an american who is worried about criminals or foreign spies or corporate espionage identity thieves or any other of the risks that you might face from having your data exposed des 50 will protect you and here was john gilmore this guy in a tie-dyed shirt with a long wizard beard who brought in his computer that he built for a quarter of a million dollars and john is a very smart guy but he's not the smartest person that ever lived or the best resource person that ever lived. He was like, I can show you, I can take Des 50 out here in the courtroom with this box that I trundled in on a hand truck. This is the, th this is all that stands between all of America and absolute devastation. It's this box, right? And so I really care about information security and I'm a fake computer scientist. I, I dropped out of a lot of undergraduate programs, never got a degree, but the Open University were kind enough to give me an honorary computer science doctorate, and I'm a visiting professor of CS there. 
And so as a fake computer scientist, one of the things that I'm keenly aware of is that we make a lot of mistakes in computer science. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that writing good programs is hard, but there's another foundational problem that dates back to the dawn of computer science, to Alan Turing and von Neumann, which is this thing called the halting state problem, which is that for computer programs beyond a certain degree of complexity, we literally cannot know all the outputs they will produce unless we run them. Uh, so there is no way to be sure that a program is bug free. There just isn't beyond a certain degree of complexity. And for that reason, we as computer programmers try to fail gracefully when we design computing systems. We make backups, we make incremental backups, we try to preserve earlier states of programs so that we can wind back to them. We um, uh, try to do a lot of error correction and catching. Uh, we try to do some things that look very blockchain-like, like we may produce logs that everyone can see so we can find bugs and so on. But really key is that we wanna be able to wind back when, we may, when our programs do things that are wrong. And so this is my first uh, issue here, is that although there are some computer science applications where you can't go back in time, right? If you write a programmable logic controller routine that controls the cooling system for a nuclear reactor, there is a certain point beyond which that program's malfunctioning cannot be unwound because the, new, the reactor will have melted down, right? Those are unavoidable. And we go to, I hope, in an ideal world, a lot of trouble to make sure that those programs are surrounded by lots of other fail safes. But when we don't have to, we never make our programs outcomes irrevocable. Never, right? It's a terrible idea. We just, th that is like everything that we know about computer security starts from the idea that computers are not infallible, predictive, uh, uh, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, deterministic robots. Yeah. They are uh, uh, wildly unpredictable, chaotic, stochastic chaos machines, and that we are barely in control of them. And we want to do everything we can to surround them by soft surfaces that we can land on when they throw us off their backs. And the first thing that I look uh, that I see when I look at blockchain is a bunch of people who have voluntarily decided to take the net out from underneath the tightrope and uh, for no good reason, right? In order to accomplish things that you can do perfectly well with the tightrope under the net. And um, I look at that and I say, this is bad practice. Like just as a technical matter, this is bad practice. And then you layer onto that smart contracts and you say, okay, well now, we have two kinds of complexity. We have the prospectus and we have the smart contract. And not only must you understand all the failure modes of the prospectus, you must also understand all the failure modes of the smart contract, both of which are non-deterministic in some profound and important sense. And then we say, it's gonna operate without a human in the loop and it will be irrevocable. And I go, oh my God, like, no one should build a system that does anything important this way unless it is literally the only way we can think of doing it and we must do it. And I don't think that almost anything I hear of anyone doing in Web3 is something that we must do and that we cannot do in any other way. And so those risks are really appreciable and I think that they are under theorized. I think they're glossed over. I think they're hand waved away. And I think that all of that combined makes them uh, a really shaky framework to be building anything important on. Yeah, and I think that's so. So just and I'm just so I'm getting the first point for listeners as well is that this point is about the, the often claimed great kind of feature, which is the irrevocability that you've kind of got this database that you can never wind back, that you can never change things. I mean, I have to say this is that. I, I, I had the privilege, or you say, to go to the first ETH con or whatever in London. I actually showed up in 2015. Uh, it was near where I near where I lived, and I got someone invited me along. And um, I talked to the founder of Juan, who actually knew Juan Benet, who'd founded IPFS. And you know IPFS probably from the Web3, D-Webs type stuff. And this is this point where I was like, hey, I remember in the late 2000s building a distributed uh, database system built by a guy called Zuko Wilcox, uh, who's also in this area. And, but I remember a friend being like, of mine. 
yeah, yeah Zuka, but I remember like setting up the system because I wanted to store open data on it. And I was like, okay, but how do I know in this case, you know, how do I have this problem of people not storing stuff, like using up lots of space that I don't know what it is because everything was encrypted. Um, and just this point there on IPFS and also on IPFS, nothing's deletable, but that this point of just to make it in reality, let's say you put up, you know, your revenge porn. I mean, these pre these points we make, uh, and I don't mean to be facetious, but that there's, re but that ability for a system, that's a great example of this rigidity with irrevocability to be a real problem. There are times we need to be able to remove things uh, from places. I I'm not saying that, just to be clear for listeners, I'm not saying that those things cannot be addressed in some way, but the underlying point, which is when you build systems, which we know have bugs, which we know have errors, with irrevocability and indelibility. And as you said, and then say this double layer of complexity, we have the white paper, which is <laughs> traditionally quite difficult to pass. And we have the smart contract is really uh, putting ourselves at, at real risk. And as you say, it's not what it seems to often be claimed as a feature as a bug and what's the benefit. And I think that's the, cr the crucial point. And you then also, we talked a little bit about oracles. Can, can I just insert a, a, a small gloss yeah. there? Yeah, I, I, I want to say uh, that um, I think you've introduced a different problem, which is also an important problem, which is the problem of unerasable information. That's a separate issue. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm talking about as a technical matter, if you want to build a system that works well and fails gracefully, if you build it out of computers that produce unreliable output, which all computers do, one of the ways to give it a soft landing is to make it revocable. And I don't think that that should be a hard limit. Like I do think we should do things like build our nuclear fuel containers using computers and not using, you know, mechanical linkages or whatever, right? I just think that when we do that, we should do it because there's no other way we can think of doing it. We should do it. And, and so, you know, like I believe in cryptography and pornographers, including pornographers who make uh, uh, child sexual abuse material, um, mafiosi, uh, use cryptography. Um, terrorists, they all use cryptography. And I think the benefit of cryptography is such that we could Outweighs. never derive it without making it unbreakable, right? There is no, there's no little bit pregnant in, in working crypto and that it outweighs the costs. And my argument is a yes. slightly different one from saying bad, bad things will be, this will be used for bad things because I know no, lots of general exactly. purpose tools that are used for bad things. I think we could do it in a way that would minimize the harm and that we've chosen to do it in a way for an arbitrary reason that, that does not minimize those harms. That's, that's the gloss I want to put on it. That's a very good point. And I, and again, I, am yes. And I, and I, and I add to that, um, that it's, it's the same as I've generally been a great supporter of peer to peer systems, though peer to peer systems, Traditionally, one of the great critiques was like, you could use P2P to send child pornography or something. And as that, while that is absolutely abhorrent, it doesn't mean that we should ban all P2P systems or something like that. Absolutely. So, I mean, just to say a little bit more about that, what would, the, the, it's your point about irrevocability and that, or in these systems that is, is the particular point and why, why we need to have some level of revocability uh, in most, most computer systems, except in these exceptional circumstances. Um, in kind of coming, just to then to come, maybe we talk about the, the oracles point and then, I mean, I had a point I want to make about that, but I'd like to talk a little bit about oracles for the moment. So do you want to talk about, first of all, what is an oracle? When we say, what do we mean by an oracle in the area of Web3 and crypto? First, it would be good to just define that for the audience. Sure. So in, in historic security contexts, we would call this a trusted third party, not, a, not an oracle, right? Uh, and in, it, you will probably be most familiar with them as escrow agents. Uh, if you're, say, buying a flat, um, you hand the the money to an escrow agent, the uh, seller hands the deed to an escrow agent, the escrow agent is trusted by both of you, they're a trusted third party, and they don't run away with the money or the deed, <laughs> because they're regulated and they're trustworthy. And then it, when when they have both in hand, they give the deed to the buyer and they give the money to the seller. Uh, and and that's a, a traditional thing that happens a lot in in transactions. The point of of the of blockchainism uh, is to build these permissionless blockchains where something other than a human does the uh, is trusted, right? So in the case of uh, Bitcoin, it's something called proof of work. 
And it's the idea that if you wanted to cheat, right, if you wanted to take the money or the deed and run away, um, you would have to perform more computation than you could possibly uh, uh, pay off with the winnings you got from stealing the assets in the blockchain. Um, with proof of stake, it's slightly different, uh, but it, it's very related. Um, there are non-proof of work and non-proof of stake stuff that I'm really interested in and scared of, which is trusted computing applications. Um, where you have things like remote attestation and secure computation within secure enclaves or or uh, cryptographic coprocessors. So that's what Moxie Marlin Spike and uh, Brady Forrest's uh, mobile coin is based on. Um, that is a thing that I found interesting enough that I gave them an infinitesimal amount of my own personal money because I thought that that uh, as an investment in the startup because I do think that there is something really interesting about building untrusted networks where the trust is derived from the computation and not from uh, the work or the stake or the people. I do think that that is, but I also should declare an interest here that that's that, that although the interest goes the other direction. I thought that was interesting. So I put a small amount of money in it, not the other way around. Um, and, uh, all of these systems are grounded in the idea that if you get rid of the humans, then you get rid of the ability of uh, humans to be suborned uh, or coerced or to become untrustworthy because of some uh, event in their moral or intellectual lives. Um, world, the world is full of people who were beloved and then woke up one day and became terrible, right? Um, you know, Twitter is full of people that I used to think very highly of who, who now exist solely to declare that trans women are not women. And that has become their sole, you know, uh, pole star in life is to, is to make that their cause. Um, there are others who, uh, well, I mean, my favorite example is Shockley who invented the transistor and got an actual Nobel prize, not an economics Nobel prize for it. And who used his Nobel prize money to go around and pay women of color to get sterilized so that they wouldn't pollute the gene pool. Uh, and as far as anyone knew, he was not a eugenicist racist prick before he won the Nobel prize. Some people think he had a stroke. He got really paranoid and weird after that as well. So, you know, there's a real problem with trusting third parties, right? Like it's a system that works well and fails badly. Um, sometimes you can have an institution built around it where if your lawyer or your agent fails in their fiduciary duty to you, you can have them recalled and maybe, maybe unwind the transaction. But either way, trusting third parties is the hardest part of any of this stuff. And so rather than having a referee who you have to trust, you have some technology. And here's where the problem comes in. Because say you and I do a, a contract that says, if you wash the windows, I'll give you some Bitcoin. Well, if I'm in charge of deciding whether my windows are clear, it's really easy for me to cheat. So why would you get involved in that contract? If you can decide whether my windows are clear, then it's very easy for you to cheat. So why would I get on the other side of that contract? And if we both trust each other not to lie about whether the windows are clear, why do we need the blockchain? Right? So by definition, things that happen on the blockchain happen between people who don't trust each other and who, who are in need of a referee. And so we hire a referee, we hire a, an Oracle and that Oracle comes by and inspects the windows and decides whether or not they're clean. And if they are, then they, then they click the radio button in the smart contract that causes it to fire and money moves from my account into your account. And we're, we're both happy. Um, here's the issue. If we trust that person to declare that the windows are well and truly clean, why do we need the blockchain? Right? The blockchain is like incredibly cumbersome. And as we've discussed, very technically dangerous way to structure transactions. If we're going to trust this person to cheat or not cheat, then why don't we trust them to hold the money? Um, and I understand that maybe there are some people who you could trust to declare where the windows are clean, but not hold the money. But I do think that then you're, you're also, you're, you're getting into this actually very narrow range of trust. I trust this person not to hold the money. I do trust this person to say where the window is clean. I also trust this person not to be bribed. So though I don't trust them to hold the money, I do trust them not to have the window cleaner say to them, Hey, if you declare that the window is clean, I'll give you 50% of the money. So you do trust them in that case, but you don't trust them to hold all of the money. 
And maybe the window cleaner could offer them 99% of the money. So you trust them with 99% of the money, but not 100% of the money. So we're getting into this like extremely narrow window of use cases where you trust people almost entirely, except in this tiny and arbitrary way, which I think anyone rational would admit is just something they pulled out of their ass. And in that case, what do you need the blockchain for? Right. What, what, what's the what's the robot referee doing for you apart from being an expensive, cumbersome security risk? Yeah, and, and this is this is so important to emphasize for maybe for people listening about a lot of the smart contracts vision is um, is requires this. I mean, almost all interesting contracts have some parameters that have to be provided by by someone by the referee. Um, and as you just point out, that's that's what. Why not then? Why do we need the blockchain? Why not just give the referee the money, as it were? And that system, you know, I mean, of course, we can say that would be run by yet another smart contract, but it kind of just iterates our system out. Out, you know, it, it just kind of takes it one layer down and adds complexity um, where cheaters can can uh, cheat. Where cheaters can cheat, more things can go wrong. We can have more systemic risk of, of things. Um, I mean, I think this is this is relates more deeply to a kind of question one can ask about the blockchain in general, which is, you know, I, I don't know. It, often it's like I'll hear people say to me, but like, you know, for example, uh, I've heard about blood diamonds or, you know, I've, I've done stuff for years over like tra because I've been in open data about like tracking um, the life cycle of products, you know, like we want to know what carbon has gone into X or Y. People are like, but isn't the blockchain perfect for that? You're like, well, is the major problem in tracking what precious metals, whether conflict metals went into your phone or what amount of carbon, is the problem really man in the middle attacks? Is it really that currently someone injects, like lie somewhere in the chain? Or is it that that information doesn't go onto the chain? go on to the kind of like the original reporting is that reliable and this is i think this is this other it kind of relates in this point which is often people misunderstand that the real problem in in real life in contracting which we definitely have as you point out about trust and so on doesn't come from this man in the middle of like oh we can't trust the information along the wire um it's that the information put on at either end it's not that we had a problem to go back to the window cleaning, it's not a problem that someone put in for, you know, the, 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 the Oracle verified something and then, oh, it got corrupted along the path in being reported. It's the problem is that the, the Oracle gets something wrong or the, or the window cleaner says, yes, I washed your windows when they actually didn't. It isn't that right. the window cleaner says, I washed your windows and then somewhere that information got corrupted before it got passed you in the email. You know, it, that's just not the, the issue we well, normally face. And back to financialization, one of the things that financialization has done is collapse the auditor sector, which is the most important oracle we have in the real economy, to four firms that are embroiled in endless scandal and are nevertheless too big to fail. And who, who you know, for example, will cook Carillion's books, which they all four of them did, and then be the only firms qualified to unwind Carillion's books after it collapses because they cooked it. And, you know, that is an actual problem that we have with trust. And it is the result of financialization, not something we solve with financialization. Uh, absolutely. Um, and I think, I think that's such a, to, to end, I mean, I think we're kind of coming towards the end of this episode. I think this is the crucial point. And for me, the fascinating point, which is that I share, I think behind the, the aspiration in many of these areas, even around trustlessness, is a desire to, funnily, is the desire to scale trust. We face challenges, whether it's the climate crisis, whether it's the complexity of our economies, whether it's even our education systems, uh, our healthcare systems, where we, we need to cooperate at a larger scale. The funny thing I would say is that the way we've done that as humanity is through, through institutions, but often also through culture. We've grown trust. Um, you just mentioned the county firm. Traditionally, one of the ways that the whatever we think of capitalism and the Protestant ethic was people were people took their duties as an auditor very seriously, and not because they were paid, because mm -hmm. it was part of who you were. If you, you were this was you were someone who was integrous, who was honest, who was strict, um, the, and it came out of the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. I mean, similarly, traditionally, bankers were not speculators. They were people who were very careful with your money. 
Um, and I think well, that you mentioned well, in theory, I, in film effect, I think film no, no, but I think we have to mention the role of the state here, right? So the the yeah. separation of the banks in in the '30s after they speculated with our money, right, and the imposition of structural separation which was not merely about ending um, speculation, but also about ending another kind of cheating, which is that banks would own firms that competed with the firms they lent money to, and they would give preferential firms uh, terms to the firms they, they owned as against the terms that they offered to their competitors, which meant that the banks decided who could sell shoes. Because the, if the shoe company sold stock to the bank, then the bank would give them cheaper loans. And if you wanted to go it on your own, then they wouldn't. And so we barred banks from owning firms that competed with their with their de with their um, debtors. And you know th that was the result of state intervention creating the framework for the game, and stepping in to provide referee services. Exactly. So I mean, I think that. The, that we we both have culture and we need these institutional structures and one of them has been the state and we should you know i've often joked that we should have these great t-shirts in this era printed with the state is great you know we live mm -hmm. in a time where we often don't appreciate the state um and actually the, the state is this extraordinary achievement certainly the democratic state so on on this note i mean maybe we might even have a follow-up but i really want to just end and, and say thank you thank you so much for for contributing and are there any things you would like to leave with Corey? i want to say one last thing yeah 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 that 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 you've just brought up here which is the relationship of the of the state to equity and how that relates to inequality and um and and the finance sector uh so one of the things that is increasingly obvious, although still a little controversial, is that the distribution of Bitcoin as or blockchain assets uh, is extremely unequal. That that it it looks even more unequal than the distribution of fiat currency, and there's some pretty obvious mechanisms for that, right? When people mint their own coins, they they keep a bunch of them. The biggest wallet on the blockchain is Satoshi's, right? Like we just we just know that that's that's a mechanism, and then the actual running of the system tends to produce these oligarchic distributions. And there is a sense in which the blockchain is, has distributed finance, right? There are a bunch of more things that look like banks now than there ever were, where those oligarchs can put their money. But the, uh, the actual distribution of the money in terms of the natural persons that control it has crashed on the blockchain, even relative to the real world. And um, I don't really care about distribution of banks. I care about distribution of money because I care about the distribution of power. And this is back to whether the state is great or not, because states are sometimes very not great. Right? There is an actual problem with regulatory capture, despite the fact that that term has its origin in the University of Chicago Economics Department and was used as a, as a weapon to argue for the dismantling of regulators. It is absolutely true that when a sector is dominated by a small number of firms, that the individuals who run those firms find it easy to collude and they find it easy to suborn their regulators and to turn those regulators into a protection racket. That if you, if there are five giant firms, four giant firms, even one giant firm in a sector, like in Europe, the and in most of the world, Luxottica Essilor, it's the only eyeglass company. They own every high street brand. They own every, every uh, manufacturing brand. They own more than 50% of the lenses. Um, that when a firm is, has that much excess capital from it, its monopolization, and when it just only has to convince two or three people to go along with the wheeze, they really can make their regulators do their bidding. And then the state becomes a means of increasing corporate power instead of checking corporate power. And instead of taking this cool view and trying to figure out what it is that's optimal for all of us, what will increase the capacity of our economy, and thus it's the fiscal space for state action and the space for private action, the state just tries to figure out how to line the pockets of rich people. You know, the PPE scandals that we're living through right now are actually a really good example of, of that, right? The chemocracy scandals in the US and the, in the UK. And um, it is only, the state is only great when the industries that it oversees, that it regulates, are not able to, to override its power because only then can it be democratically accountable. And only when when politicians care more about votes than donations, do they respond to the needs of the people. And does that 
somewhat patrician ethic you were describing, you know, that that is not unique to auditors, but actually is part of the political ethic. And we, you know, all the way back to Rome, you have people talking about how a good politician sees himself as a servant of the people, that that requires that they be dependent on the people for their power. And, you know, there are people who think of themselves as servants of the people who get into office and who discover that they cannot wield power without keeping rich people happy and who strike compromises that make them deeply unhappy and cynical and bitter. And they either st stay in and continue to do things they think are wrong, or they leave and walk away in disillusionment. And, you know, that's why the we didn't talk about about monopoly at all, really. But that's why trust busting and the new current for trust busting is so important and why I think it is the keystone to understanding all of this. And I think that what I'll say at the end, my final thing is at 2008, we hit a fork in the road after the crisis when regulators decided that they would keep the banks whole instead of helping the people that the banks uh, li that the banks had ruined their lives. And that crossroads down one path went Occupy that said we must check corporate power because corporations have suborned the state and um, they are cheating. And on the other path, we had Bitcoin, which said corporations have suborned the state and they are cheating and that should be us. Right? We're the ones who should be the beneficiaries of the largesse. Right? The problem is the wrong people are having the state help them structure our economy and decide how we live our lives. And that should be us. We should have a meritocracy and that meritocracy will be determined by who can get the most Bitcoins. And um, then we w then the, to the extent the state plays a role, that role will be to make sure that the contracts that we arm twist people into are honored uh, because we will be wielding power and we will have demonstrated our fitness to do it by uh, uh, amassing more Bitcoin than anyone else. And I think that's the cru the crucial that the political vision ultimately offered is a very arid one, a very even a dark one, and and at the same time it comes from a a suffering or even an insight and a critique that is very valid. I think what you're saying is that the you know and I think the line goes up the, the Olson documentary makes that very well at the end and I think this is also why this is sociologic sociologically such an interesting moment in that the the wellspring of the dissatisfaction is perfectly understandable and, and and valid there is something rotten at the moment in our there is there there is something really foundationally broken in our current economic and social systems but rather than as it were about fully abandoning we should seek to, to to not i wouldn't say heal it it might need something radically new but it isn't that path it isn't a path of hayekian libertarianism in a weird way and i suppose i end by saying you know one remain i remain very open-minded and i find what i find fascinating about this area is that there are both people on the right and say it's you know or i don't even say right or left it's libertarian but they're also like the kind of bitcoin socialist but it's this but it's as you say the, it's the path of Occupy, and it's a path of, I think, engaging with these institutions and, and is of trust busting and of different alternatives that ultimately, I hope maybe, of course, they will use technology, but maybe not this one. But anyway, thank you. Thank you very, Thanks, very much, Corey, for today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And please, uh, obviously, I think it's not, I, I, I won't, uh, I will put in the show notes links to your, your manifold works. Um, uh, I know Twitter, uh, I mean, Corey is very well known, so you should, a quick Google will find him, but I will put them in the show notes. But thank you very, very much. If you want to find out more about this project, check out web3.lifeitself.us and upcoming episodes. Anything more before we leave today, Corey, other than a goodbye? No, thank you. Corey. Yeah, no, that, this was lovely and, and very invigorating, Rufus. Thank you. I've had a lovely time.